What's up, everyone, and welcome back to the Jacob and Jacob podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Pear. Filling in for my co-host, Jacob Obam, I have my good friend, Benny Ehrlich. Benny, thank you for filling in for him today. And today, our special guest is PGA golfer and 2009 British Open champion, Stuart Sink. Stuart, thank you so much for coming on today. Hey, absolutely. My pleasure. So, Stuart, I saw that you're a big Atlanta Hawks fan, and I hate to say it, but your Hawks just beat my Sixers last round and tonight they have a chance to go up three two against the bucks and milwaukee doesn't have Giannis. so how good are you feeling about the hawks right now well um you know you don't really ever want to see a series decided by injuries but uh, we thought before game four that it might be decided by injuries the other way because trey young got declared ineligible uh or you know unable to go because of his weird uh stepping on the ref thing so um but it's part of sports, especially this year, you know, with uh, the bubble and then quick turnaround and 72 games all sandwiched in. There's just uh, a lot of tired bodies out there. And uh, so I hope Giannis is OK. I heard there was no structural damage the other day to his MRI. I hope he's OK. He's a great player. And I hope we'll be able to reappear in this series because it, it, it could be really great. Um, the Bucks are good and the Hawks are surprising people, which is fun to watch. For sure. Yeah. Um, to get now let's get into the golf portion of the interview. So you joined the PGA Tour in 1997 and you're still on the tour today. What will you credit for the longevity of your career? What do you what would you say is the reason that you've been able to have this type of longevity? Uh, I think number one, I just really love playing and practicing. I really enjoy it. Um, I've never had really any lulls in my career where I just didn't really want to be out there. And so uh it's been a long time and I know a lot of my friends who are my age who have retired or gotten, you know, lost their card or whatever, a long time ago suffered from that and it, it cost them. But for me, I just have always really enjoyed it. And um, I think that's the biggest thing that's driven me. And, um, you know, I, I used to always say I've kept in decent shape and that's helped me withstand just the traveling and the constant practice and the pounding of walking and competing and all that. But, um, I really think that the passion for golf really has it's it takes a, a higher seat in that priority list than even the conditioning and, and the training, because uh, without the passion for it, I wouldn't have done all the training. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, going back to the beginning of your career, what advice would you tell yourself going into the long, great career that you've had? I think the biggest thing would be that I've learned along the way, I would tell my young self would be to not sweat the small stuff. And it's a phrase that you hear all the time in life, but I think in golf, it really, really is a, a big, big deal that you feel like every three putts, like the end of the world. And, you know, you miss a fairway, you just want to like, just break your neck or something. And it's just, you, you just end up costing yourself because your attitude suffers and your, your, your positivity, your belief and, I would just say, don't sweat the small stuff. So you said you, you know, a lot of people you've had fellow golfers have retired. Do you know when you think it'll be time to hang it up or you just don't envision that in, in, in the near future? I think it, yeah, there'll be a time. I mean, and golf is uh, kind of a unique sport because we don't have contracts like team uh, players do. So no one really holds that press conference and says like, I've decided to retire at the end of the season. And, um, Golf, pretty much, you, you play until the game and the rules on tour say you can't play anymore. You're not welcome, and uh, with very few exceptions. So not many players will walk away until they're literally done. And um, I don't know. I mean, if you asked me when I was 25, I would have said there's no chance I was going to be playing golf when I was old enough for the Champions Tour, and that's now uh, just under two years away from me, and I don't see any sign of stopping. I mean, now playing for almost 20 years on the PGA Tour, what's the biggest thing that you've seen change from the beginning to where you are now in your career? The biggest change in the golf has been the equipment since I started. And um, when I played early on as a kid, I played with the wood driver and I played ground balls. You guys are probably too young to even know what those are. But we used to play a golf ball that was like it, it had a rubber center and then it had a bunch of rubber bands tightly wound and then it had a cover. And it was what we thought was a great ball. You had to choose either I want the ball that performs well, like you can spin it, you can curve it and you control it, or you wanted to have a ball that went really far mm -hmm. and it was durable and it would just, it would go forever. But if there was a firm green or you had a chip or something, you, you couldn't make it stop. And then uh, 
Titleist pretty much changed the game when they came out with Pro V1 around, uh, I think we're right around the 20th anniversary of the Pro V1 right now. And uh, it gave you the ability to hit the long ball off the tee and also the control ball into the green. So it gave you the best of both worlds. And that really changed the game, especially at the pro level, because we, we learned how to launch that ball really fast and really far. And all the distance debate that's going on right now around the game, which I'm sure you heard about, all of that is due to the golf ball. I mean, I don't know if you're a collector, but how many golf clubs do you think you have in your house right now? <laughs> well, we just moved into a new place and we had to downsize quite a bit. I mean, I live in a condo in Atlanta and we used to live in a nice big house out in the suburbs. But uh, to move into this condo, we didn't have as much storage space. So I probably gave away, uh, I'm going to guess probably a thousand clubs. Oh, wow. Um, and that was just this last round. I've been giving away clubs in anticipation of this move for like two years. And um, I'm not really a hoarder when it comes to clubs because I give away things for signing, you know, like autographs and uh, kids I know or whatever, people that are into the game. And I'm like, hey, try this driver. But some clubs have had a lot of meaning to me, like the clubs I won the British Open with, um, special meaning to maybe like a shot I hit that I wanted to keep that, you know, maybe a putt that won a tournament. And I accumulated quite a few clubs and I did actually end up moving here with a couple hundred too, but um, junior golf in Atlanta, Georgia is in good shape with clubs right now. Cause they just got a huge donation. <laughs> and you talked about the, your British open win in 2009. So, I mean, I just want to talk about that win. What was the experience like to, I mean, you were so close so many times at so many different events to finally go up and win the 2009 British open. Uh, well, you know, you play for the majors and, um, it's how you will be remembered. And if you choose, if that's what you choose to be playing for, you know, your legacy or whatever, then the majors are where it's all at. But really uh, for me, I just felt like the majors were the best test. And uh, it's golf has always been for me about learning about how I react in certain situations and how I can improve the next time and just try to get a little bit better. And so the majors give you the most opportunity to learn, you know, when you're in that uh, last couple of groups, when you have a chance to win and you're uh, sweating it out, you really learn a lot about yourself. And uh, so that was the the best thing that day for me was being in the hunt, seeing Tom Watson involved and, you know, coming so close to winning was just unbelievable. Like almost uh, like a dream for a lot of people, including me. And, uh, but in the end, you know, I learned a lot about myself and I learned about how I can win those tournaments. And um, it only happened once for me so far, maybe again, but it was a really cool day. And, uh, I know a lot of people remember because they were rooting for Watson and that's okay with me. So golf is a very mental sport. And winning a major, I think there's probably a lot of pressure on you inside, like internal pressure, external pressure. What would you say the thought process is through the, through the tournament and especially on the last day? Well, I think if you're really hitting on all cylinders, then the preparation is the same every day, whether it's Thursday or Sunday, it doesn't matter. Um, that's one reason that the, the best players are so good in the clutch is because they treat the clutch just like it's any other shot. And that takes a lot of mental strength and, and trust to do that. But that's where you have to get. And so if you go into Sunday's round preparing differently, then um, you probably need to rethink that. And so I think that most good players, the, the players who have had a chance to come out on top in a big tournaments like the majors would say, that they just learn to do the same thing. They keep their routine the same, their exercise the same. Uh, and it's not because of superstition. It's just because that's the way that our like human beings tend to perform best if you have a routine that you can focus on. And so um, that week at, at the Open, I remember uh, I actually had to break my routine a little bit because I was quite sick and I didn't do any post-round practice. Um, I just would do my morning warm-up and then uh, – in the exercise trailer or the gym and then warm up on the range and get ready to go play golf and basically go back to the hotel and just kind of lay around and do nothing. It was, I didn't feel great, but it was really great to, as it turned out for rest. And so, um, as I've gotten older now I'm, I'm 48 and rest is a lot bigger deal than it used to be because I just don't have the boundless energy that I used to have. And, and so, um, I can think back to that, event in 2009 and how much of a factor rest was. And um, I just do try to take it easy now a little bit more. So what would a normal routine be like and a non-sick routine for you? 
Um, well, I would have normally practiced after the round. Uh, that's something I used to do a lot of, and I probably did too much. I don't remember thinking back. I don't remember ever really benefiting from a post round practice session that much. And finally, my trainers that I work with, uh, they called me out on it and said, you know what, you got to, you're on a 20 ball limit after the round. And, uh, once I understood why they put me on a limit, I've made it pretty much a zero ball limit. I, I just really don't go and practice after the round anymore, but I used to. And so, um, nowadays though, uh, a tournament round, a tournament day for me looks like, uh, the alarm is set for three hours before the start time. And that doesn't matter. Um, if it's, if I'm teeing off at seven Oh eight, the alarm's four Oh eight. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, it gives me time to get up, shower, do my morning routine that I need to do, get my heart and mind kind of in the right place and decide. Uh, I like to try to control the things I can, know I can control and let the other things completely go. So I don't want to have like one toe halfway in the control water of things that I can't control. So um, I do spend a lot of time focusing on what those things are. If I know it's going to be blowing 30 miles an hour out there one day, I have to remind myself and prepare for kind of the expectations of what it's going to feel like and what it's going to be like to uh, not be able to control a lot of that. And so um, I'll spend about 35 minutes in the workout trailer and, and I, I don't really like, it's not lifting a lot of weight. It's not like squats or anything, but just a lot of body weight, getting the sweaty, some balance activity, just to get my body warmed up and my heart rate up and, and just get moving. And then um, I do a little putting practice, just a little uh, station that I set up to kind of make sure I'm starting the ball in line. A little bit of chipping that's similar to that, just a little block practice. And I, my warm up actually hitting balls. I hit balls for probably about like between 18 and 22 minutes before each round. And it's not that I want to have that routine. Like I feel like I need to have 18 minutes of hitting balls just the way it works out. And by the time I go to the workout trailer and get sweaty, I'm really loose already. So it takes me about three or four balls to get where I could, I could go to the first tee after three shots, but, um, it, it's actually, it gets me to where I can practice a little bit on the range instead of just trying to get warmed up. So would you say you wouldn't adjust your um, routine based on the, I guess, like event that you're playing in, like the masters compared to a smaller event or same routine for every event that you play in? Same exact routine for every event, no matter what, mm -hmm. except there is an exception. And that is if the, let's say the range is like, a, you got to take a shuttle ride to it which is sometimes the case, you know, you, you play in some of these majors where they have these huge build outs with the sponsor tents and everything. And sometimes they put the sponsor tent right on the range and they put a temporary range somewhere else and you got to take a shuttle to it. It just adds time. And so I would just uh, figure out in the practice rounds, how much time it takes to get on the shuttle and go out there and do all that. And then just work that back in my calendar, my clock. And maybe I wake up, you know, 14 minutes early or something like that. It's, it's a routine thing. You know, I like to, I don't really like to be rushed. And uh, I know how long it takes me to do all the stuff I have to do in all those places. And it just becomes like, a, how long is your commute? You know, if you live, if you live on 14th street and you commute to 12th street, what if you move out to 80th street and you commute to 12th street? You know, it's a commute thing. For sure. And as a guy who's played on so many of these courses and so many of these different events, what would you say is your favorite course to play on? My favorite course probably on the PGA tour would be the uh, Harbor town golf links at the heritage down in Hilton head. It's a, it's a really different course. It's, it's kind of an outlier for us on the PGA tour. It's not that long. It's really narrow. There's a lot of trees that come in everywhere and it's just a beautiful area. It's a fun course to play. Uh, I've got two wins there, which is also nice. It's a, it's a really good feeling to be there. So to shift to another aspect of golf, golf isn't a team sport, so we don't get to see rivalries really in the sport. Recently, there's been a bit, bit big news, news, media maybe a little hyped up between Bruce Kepka and Dishambo. Do you think that's helpful for the sport or does it like put a bad connotation with the sport? I think it's helpful. I mean, I think there's a lot of people talking about it that probably wouldn't be talking about golf otherwise. And so in a way, that's not a bad thing. I mean, it's not like those guys are going to kill each other. They just <laughs> have this little rivalry and, and they're both, you got to remember, they're both at the top of the game and they both intensely are competitive and want to win. And, um, uh, I think if the, if you put a ping pong match together between those two, you might see strangling going on, <laughs> but on the golf course, they're going to be civil. And one day they're going to be paired together somewhere. I don't, I haven't paid attention to the rocket mortgage this week. I don't think they're paired together, but 
one day they're going to get paired together and the, the eyes of the world are going to focus on that and see if there's like a fist fight or an arm wrestling match or something. I mean, for you, if you could pick one golfer to play 18 with, who would it be? And if you could be paired with anyone on. Oh uh, man. Um, one, are you talking about on a tour, one of the pros out yeah. there? I mean, it could be all uh, time. It could be current. All time. It could be current or all time or both. All time. I, if, well, I'll do, I'll pick a current one. Um, first and it's hard because there's a lot of guys I like playing with but uh I think I, I like Tony Fina a lot he's a super nice guy and he's impressive the way he hits the ball I mean there's I see good shots all the time but then there's other guys that hit just unbelievable shots like the distance and the accuracy and uh, and Tony Fina's got it I mean he's just such a he's a almost like an aberration even for PGA Tour guys um, and he's a, he's a, just a great guy to, to be around too. And then, uh, from the past, I would like to go pretty far back and pick somebody that i never saw play, but, um, I always thought Byron Nelson would be a cool guy to watch play because of the whole, like, what did he win? Like 400 straight tournaments or something back in 1945. Um, I'd like to see like, what was that all about? You know, like, how did, how did he do that? And I'd put a very close second to, to Hogan because of the mystique, although I don't think Hogan would speak to me. <laughs> Well, Stuart, we want to thank you again for coming on today. But before we let you go, we have a similar question to last question. But we want to know your opinion on this. If you could build a golfer, how would you build it? Like, could you, would you take Tiger's swing? Would you take Rory's putting game? I mean, it's up to you. What would you do? I get the if I could take all the all the components of the of the best golfer I've ever seen. Oh, well, I, I guess you the rules of the game, right? I'm not allowed to use Tiger Woods more than once, probably. <laughs> Because <laughs> I would probably yeah. use it for everything. <laughs> I just picked different years. 2001, Tiger. 1999, Tiger Putty. <laughs> 2009, Tiger Short Game. No. Um, I mean, I, I, I'd say this is a fun game if you're not allowed to use Tiger at all. So I use other players. I would pick Dustin Johnson's physique and his long game. His, um, his swing and the way he, you know, his mechanics. Um, I would pick... Uh, Patrick Reed's short game a good around the greens. Just this guy is just an absolute wizard and he's fun to watch. And uh, as far as putting God, every year that changes, but um, the best putters are so simple and, and so um, they're so re repetitive with the way they uh, just repeat the stroke and the solid contact and start the ball in line. Uh, who would be my putter right now? I'd, Pat Kizire is a nice putter. I really like the way he putts. And I know he's got confidence. He starts the ball in line and he rolls it beautifully. And if I had to pick a uh, somebody for mental toughness, I would probably pick Jack Nicholas when he was in his prime. He just was – he was a steel cage. And he was kind of a – Tiger, obviously, was a great mental player too. But since I'm not answering Tiger Woods, I would pick Jack. Stuart, we want to thank you again for coming on today. We really enjoyed our conversation with you. And hopefully we can do it again. Sure thing. Good job out there.